welcome everyone to uh, this uh, new international construction arbitration series. I'm uh, Rafael Carmona from the ICVR, and I want to take a moment of your time before we begin uh, this uh, new series to remind you that you can join as an ICVR YNI associate. If you Google us ICVR Young and International, you're going to be able to find our website where you will find registration forms in English and in Spanish. And also there you will find our library of webinar programs. If you missed last year construction arbitration series, you're going to be able to find the webinars there. In addition, you can join our LinkedIn group. Again, it's inter ICDR uh, Young and International. You'll be able to find us and join that group where we'll be also posting all of our updates. I will also take a moment to thank our co-sponsors, the ABA Forum on Construction Law, the Society of Construction Law North America, and uh, Y Construction, uh, Young International Construction Practitioners. And uh, another special thanks to uh, Zach Torres and all the board members of our ICDR YNI Global and executive boards for organizing this construction series. But with that, I won't take any more of your time. Uh, we're all looking forward to learn about dispute boards. So uh, Santiago will be moderating the panel. Santiago, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafa. Um, good morning and or, or good evening, everyone. I'm Santiago Peña. I'm a member of ICDR uh, YNI Global Advisory Board. And as Rafa said, I will moderate uh, today's webinar, which is the first of a second editions webinar series on international construction arbitration. And the main subject uh, today is uh, dispute board procedures and practice. To address this issue, we have uh, four recognized experts in the field, which I'm going to introduce very briefly. First, we have Luis Martinez. I think everyone knows Luis, but uh, just in case, uh, he's by vice president of ICDR in New York, honorary president of the Inter-American Commercial Arbitration Commission and responsible for the ICDR's cross-border arbitration and mediation in the region. Thank you, Luis, for being here today with us. Next is Aisha Nadar. Aisha is a senior consultant specialized in infrastructure procurement and dispute management at advocate firm Roneland in Istacon. For over 30 years, Aisha has been actively involved in all phases of the negotiation and implementation of large scale cross border infrastructure and defense programs. Aisha, it's a pleasure to have you here. Next is uh, Sherry Brodsky. Sherry is a partner and director of Pecker and Abramson's Latin American practice in Miami and certified as a construction law specialist by the Florida Bar. Sherry, it's an honor to have you here. And finally, we are also pleased to have Eric Franco. Eric is legal manager of ENGIE in Peru, fellow member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a very well-known arbitrator in the region. Thank you very much, Eric, for being here with us today. Before we begin, I would also like to thank you all the audience uh, for being present today and remind you that you can ask uh, questions for the panelists through the Q&A function or even through the chat. It's up to you. So first issue to be addressed today is the concept of dispute boards and its regulation. I would, uh, I would start asking Luis uh, in general terms, how would you define a dispute board? And if you can summarize us, what we are going to find in the new ICDR rules on dispute boards. Well, thanks, Santiago. And it is a pleasure to join the panel today and to discuss the work that we've been doing uh, in revitalizing and revising our dispute avoidance resolution board procedures. Uh, let me start off by saying that uh, international construction is certainly an important caseload for the ICDR. Each year, it's one of the business sectors that most often use our services. Uh, we certainly work with the domestic construction division. The, the AAA's construction caseload is uh, extremely large and important uh, and also uh, well-developed over its years of experience in the U.S. market. So we team together. I work with our domestic colleagues from the AAA's construction division, uh, Michael Mara, Mike Powell, Rod Tobin. Uh, and we continue to explore synergies to promote and develop our services domestically and internationally. For example, some of the things we did was uh, work on the construction mega panel, 
We have the international construction roster of arbitrators. We look at ways of revitalizing these panels and looking at diversity and expertise, important factors. So in 2021, we started working on revising the AAA ICDR DRB procedures at that time, which really hadn't been looked at since the year 2000 and were in need of revision and updating. Um, we really wanted to ensure that these procedures, they were transparent, they reflected exactly what would the procedures be employed and followed, that they reflected the administrative services we would provide. We wanted to simplify these procedures as much as possible. Uh, at that time, there were three separate documents. So the new document, which by the way, we expect to be finalized this year, but the new document is rolled into one, making it much e easier to follow. And we wanted to incorporate the best practices from various sources and to also focus on dispute avoidance uh, as well as the resolution throughout the process. Another objective was to draft these procedures with both domestic US and international practice in mind, uh, given that uh, we receive requests for these services from both the international and domestic markets. So given those objectives, we set out to work with a number of our advisors, domestic and international. We work closely with the AAA ICDR's National Construction Dispute Resolution Committee, the NCDRC Rules Subcommittee, which was actually led by John Bowman and Wendy Benoit. We worked with Adrian Bastinelli, who did a great deal of the drafting. And we also incorporated international perspective. We had comments from Aisha, who's with us today, Roberto Hernandez, Luis Enrique Graham. So the final version is now currently before our practice committee. That's the last step and uh, hopefully it will be released soon. So let me start off by some of the things and uh, these are definitions taken from the actual DARB procedures. Um, so what is a dispute avoidance and resolution board? Well, normally it's three impartial and independent construction professionals selected and approved by the owner and contractor for their experience in the type of construction project involved to assist the owner and contractor in avoiding and resolving disputes. Now, uh, I'm just briefly gonna go through some of the highlights because uh, the panel is gonna be discussing some of the issues that I've teed up. Uh, but briefly, the board meets regularly with representatives of the parties at the job site or virtually as well, at which time the board and the parties discuss the progress of the work, difficulties encountered, potential future claims or disputes, and ways to avoid and resolve them in real time. Uh, site visits are made to observe the progress of the work after these particular meetings. Now, in the event that a dispute actually arises, uh, under these procedures that we're proposing, the owner or contractor has a couple of op options. They can refer the dispute board uh, through the interim advisory process, which is a more expeditious proceeding to provide the parties with immediate verbal or written guidance on an issue to help the parties to resolve the issue uh, promptly. The board's advisory opinion is non-binding on the parties and the dispute uh, may be presented subsequently through the other option, which is the formal process. Now, <clears throat> in the formal process, each party is given the opportunity to present its position in writing and then, if needed, verbally at a hearing. Promptly after completion of the proceedings, the board provides written recommendations for resolution of the dispute to the parties. Now, depending on the contract requirements of the parties, the recommendations or determinations, they can be either one, non-binding recommendations, two, binding determinations until possibly overturned in a subsequent dispute resolution proceeding, and if non-binding, the recommendations may be designated as admissible or not admissible in a subsequent dispute resolution proceeding. If there's not a designation, the default will be that the recommendation 
is admissible in a later proceeding, but non-binding. Now, the AAA ICDR will assist in the selection of the board members. It's going to prepare and provide notices of meetings, transmit meeting minutes and board recommendations, and of course, handle all the financials, collecting member fees, paying expenses, and then provide other services as may be needed. Now, keep in mind that this board, as an independent third party, will assist in and facilitate the avoidance of the possible dispute. And if that is not possible, the timely resolution of disputes between the parties. The board will encourage and promote resolution of disputes by the parties through good faith discussion and negotiation with the parties to avoid referring disputes to the board in the first place. Now, all board members and the authorized representatives of the owner and contractor, and this is important, shall execute a three-party agreement within 14 days after the selection of the third board member. This agreement actually formalizes the creation of the board. It's going to establish clearly the scope of its services and the rights and responsibilities of the boards and the parties. So that gives us the structure and how the board is going to proceed. Uh, prior to the dissemination of a list, and I want to chat about quickly how they are selected, uh, the AAA ICDR will discuss this with the parties and discuss what qualifications exactly expertise uh, that they are seeking for a potential list. Now, we are going to provide the list and the list will be created. It'll be a, a roster of our DR, DARB members. We're also enhancing that list as we speak, uh, looking at uh, the experienced uh, people that are on there. We want to look at diversity. We want to look at global construction professionals for the various markets in which we operate. And the parties will consult in good faith to reach agreement on the members that will constitute that particular board. So if the parties are unable, to mutually agree on the members, the board is going to consist of one member nominated by the owner and approved by the contractor, one member nominated by the contractor and approved by the owner, and then a third member nominated by the first two members and approved by both the owner and the contractor. And the third member will serve as chair unless the parties agree otherwise. Uh, the uh, I, uh, if if we don't have a list constituted at that point, we can send a second list to see if that's helpful. And if that fails, uh, ultimately the AAA ICDR can make those appointments. For a single member board, we use a list method. We'll send a list out to the parties depending on how many people they want to have included in the list. Uh, they can object to anyone on the list and then number the remaining board members in order of preference with number one being their first choice. And then when the lists are sent back to us, we'll invite the board member with the highest number reflecting the highest preference of the parties. Now, keep in mind, the board members must be impartial and independent. They go through a conflict checklist. They disclose any circumstances likely to give rise to justifiable doubts as to their impartiality or independence. Any challenges raised are determined by the AAA ICDR. And then the board shall receive reports and project uh, meeting minutes, et cetera. Periodic meetings and site visits will be scheduled at regular intervals. And all that can be discussed. Uh, the guidelines include references, how these will be handled, how hearings will be handled, uh, and then parties may refer the, uh, as I mentioned, the disputes to the interim advisory process or the formal process. And a referral to the board using the formal process as when one side believes that their bilateral negotiations are not likely to succeed or they've reached an impasse. The formal process is structured and follows the hearing rules, which are also included in these procedures. And the parties, once they receive recommendations, will advise the board whether they accept or reject these recommendations. Uh, they can be binding or non-binding as mentioned. And if that falls through, they can also explore mediation. 
And at the end of the process, if the recommendations are not accepted, the dispute then uh, in the rules references that it's referenced, it's submitted to arbitration, and they have a choice of using the AAA's construction rules or the AAA ICDR's international rules. So that's just sort of an overview, Santiago. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you for further discussion. Thank you very much, Liz. That was a great overview and explanation. Um, I will now move to Aisha, and I would like to ask you, uh, which are the main characteristics of a dispute board and which are the main differences with other dispute resolution mechanisms? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Santiago, and um, thank you for your question, and thank you for inviting me to join the panel today. I will dovetail um, my answer to your question, kind of um, following what Lewis had said. Um, if you look at the main characteristics of dispute boards, in their first beginning, they are, uh, if you have a standing dispute board, one that's appointed at the inception of the project and lives um, or uh, throughout the, the carries on through the project duration, project execution life cycle. In the first beginning, the, the main characteristic is you're having an expert board, like Lewis said, that, that is agreed upon by both parties and is chosen for their uh, knowledge in similar projects and their ability to help the parties res avoid disputes in the first instance. So one of the main characteristics is that the board's obligation is to keep cognizant and informed about the project, which then turns into the platform and the information that allows the board to, Lewis mentioned real-time dispute resolution, allow or dispute avoidance in the first instance and giving opinions, either written or verbal. So with that platform, with that information of their past experience and the selection criteria, along with keeping abreast of the progress and, and understanding what's happening on this particular project, this allows the features to be enhanced. So for in, in regard to dispute avoidance, this is, it, it allows them to be able to give, to um, be aware of the issues. So this is one of the main features that they can live with the project and help the parties identify issues in a, it early, such that they don't escalate into disputes in the first instance. The second feature that is, um, that is drawn out of this is that they can give real-time opinions that Lewis was talking about. And so if the parties disagree on the contractual uh, or interpretation of a particular provision in the contract, the board is able to give a near real-time opinion, either verbally or in some written format that is non-binding upon the parties, but they have that information to do it quickly because they've invested the time since the inception of the project to keep up abreast. And the third feature is that they can, if the dispute can't be avoided or the opinion needs more, uh, the, the parties need more convincing argument from the board, um, they, can they can pursue a formal referral and the board can either give a binding recommendation or a non-binding recommendation, depending on the type of board and, the, and what the parties choose to have that board member to do. So I would say the three unique features is that, that they, they, they are well-informed party participants. They can help the parties avoid disputes in the first instance, and they can give near real-time opinions or determinations, depending on what the parties require. Now you asked me the second part, and I'll try and do this a little quicker, um, is how to distinguish this from other dispute resolution tools. If we say the typical um, spectrum 
or continuum of dispute resolution tools that, that uh, starts with uh, dispute avoidance to litigation, you'll find dispute boards kind of in the middle. Because if we look at um, what parties are expecting from their dispute third party neutral or the dispute resolution tool, they're either expecting facilitation of their negotiations, a non-binding non opinion or evaluation, or they're expecting a binding decision um, that is enforceable either by contract or at law. And so if you look at the dispute board, be it a dispute review board or a dispute adjudication board, it's found in the middle and, and it can be considered as a hybrid because we can see this early neutral evaluation approach, a non-binding opinion. We can see the facilitation in helping the parties reach um, somehow facilitating their dialogue to avoid the disputes in the first instance. So we see a little bit of uh, the features of mediation, a little bit of the features of expert determination. And if you want a binding enforceable decision, we see binding expert determination or, so we can't get as far as arbitration, but I would say it's a hybrid that borrows features to a greater or lesser extent of many of the dispute resolution tools that we're familiar with expert determination, mediation, and um, adjudicate, statutory adjudication in the U UK, for example. So I'll stop there. That's great, Aisha, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, Luis, Eric, Sherry, if you have any further comments, um, please go ahead. And if not, I, I will move forward with another question, but I don't know, Sherry. Um, I, I'd like to, I think that, more than a question, I think that it's important to understand um, in the context of both Luis's uh, uh, presentation on the mechanics and, 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 uh, and the details, as well as Aisha's uh, uh, comments. Um, some people may be asking themselves, why do the dispute boards exist? What, why do we have them at all? And, and I think that understanding that it, it, puts everything into a, a broader and, and, and clearer context. Dispute boards are, are really the response of the construction industry to the uh, um, um, very common place obligation of parties, particularly in infrastructure projects, of keep, they have to keep working while they have disputes. Most infrastructure contracts today have a clause that says, you, if you have a dispute, you need to keep working throughout the resolution of that dispute. And that puts an enormous burden on parties that have claims and disputes to essentially finance uh, significant portions of the project during the dispute process. And if that dispute process is an arbitration or worse, uh, uh, something in court, we could be talking about years. So the response of the industry to that dynamic, not being able to stop, is, is what generates the creation of dispute boards as an agile, contemporary, um, and um, executable uh, uh, mechanism to keep the flow of resources in a project um, uh, by having impartial people that are qualified and trained provide either permanent or at least interim resolution to disputes that keep the projects going. The history uh, in all of our countries is replete with projects that have gone into dispute and then stopped for years, losing the investment and losing the opportunity to deliver those infrastructures that are so needed in our countries. Um, particularly when you have lending institutions uh, such as at the IDB, um, they want their investment protected. They don't want it stuck for years in an arbitration or in a litigation process. And therefore it is mostly lenders that insist 
uh, when, as part of as part of their their uh, um, uh, willingness to to uh, uh, provide those loans, that their projects have this mechanism um, as part of uh, 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 this contractual mechanism, whether it be a dispute adjudication board or dispute review board. There's all of the permutations that uh, that uh, Luis has has uh, 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 presented for us. Uh, but having them active and having them named and in place from the beginning of the project so that um, they can quickly resolve uh, uh, and provide at least interim resolution uh, uh, to, to projects. Typical turnaround time of a dispute board process, if you look at a fitted contract, it's going to be 84 days. But in, and in many other contracts, you're looking at periods of 100, less, 100 days or less. Um, you're not going to have an arbitration in, in 100 days or less. Uh, and you're certainly not going to have a judicial dispute resolved in 100 days or less. But if that's what you have, um, then at least, um, uh, you, like I said, you're protecting the, the flow of resources uh, to the project and avoiding the stoppage, which is the death sentence for our infrastructure projects. So I wanted to make that comment just to create some, give some context as to why we're here. Why are we talking about dispute boards? Um, um, so I, I, I'll, I'll stop right there. Uh, that, that's excellent, Sherry. Thank you very much. I think uh, you have both Aisha and, and Jerry, maybe you have already answered this question, but um, in your experience, why would the parties of a construction contract decide to submit future dispute to a dispute board instead to arbitration or litigation? And maybe um, I think it's, it's most um, more interest, interesting to, to know if arbitration is threatened by a uh, dispute boards. What is your opinion about this? I don't know, Aisha, Cherry, even Eric, please, of course. I, the question was, made uh, mainly for Aisha, but of course, uh, I, I think this chat is very good. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll comment briefly. I think um, we, we see that um, dispute boards and arbitration, they serve two different purposes in the dispute management model of parties. If we, if we just focus on the construction industry, in addition to what Jerry was saying that you must get on with the project and you cannot stop to resolve um, issues and disputes as you're going forward. You have to make progress. If we look at the nature of relationships within the construction industry, we see repeat partnerships and repeat customers. Dispute boards and, and, and avoiding your disputes in the first instance or making a, a pragmatic uh, job site or tends to help the parties not get into that adversarial uh, stance, which will hurt potentially their relationship. So I think in, in a construction industry, in any industry, but we're talking about construction here, um, where relationships are important, where there are risks and long-term contracts, dispute boards pay, play the role of giving that real-time decision-making, whether binding or non-binding, or and, and helping the parties avoid their disputes in the first instance, and also preserving relationships as you go on. Because in any construction contract, you know that risks will eventuate, and you know that tensions may escalate at some point. So how can you de-escalate on the job site and resolve the issues with the people that are doing the building or constructing? Um, you give yourself the best chance at success and the best chance at a continued relationship. So I think they, th there's no competition between arbitration and dispute boards. They, 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 they're tools in the toolbox and they serve different roles. I, I Aisha, thank you. Uh, you, you you've uh, said something that is super, super important. And I, I tell my clients, um, you know, a, a large infrastructure project is kind of with all the players, 
uh, and stakeholders, it's kind of like a symphonic orchestra. And everybody needs to be playing uh, um, in the same tune. How could you possibly have a, a, uh, a, an infrastructure project or a um, concert if the players are fighting with each other during the process? Um, it destroys the harmony that you need, the, co the coordination that you need in order to deliver the project or in order to play very nice music. There's the, you can't have uh, a war in the middle of a construction project. That is a, 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 a terrible thing to happen. And as you well mentioned, it destroys the relationships. Um, um, whereas a dispute board preserves uh, the relationships. In terms of arbitration versus dispute boards, um, I, I also agree with what you said. They serve different purposes, but more importantly, um, if the goal is to keep the project going and to have an agile and contemporaneous uh, process, that's not what arbitration does. That's Arbitration doesn't do that. And it's not designed to do that. Um, many times dispute board decisions end up in arbitration. Many times they don't. Um, um, and those that don't need not have and shouldn't have been. So there is no competition, although there are many arbitration practitioners that at least initially before they, they hear a webinar like this one can feel threatened uh, by uh, 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 dispute boards. Dispute boards are not a threat to arbitration. What, it, what dispute boards do is, is more like a filter um, so that what gets to arbitration is what, what should have been in arbitration. And the perfect example uh, that I was involved with is the Panama Canal, where because of the work of dispute boards and, and other mechanisms, um, the project was able to be delivered after it had stopped uh, in, in, in 2013, came to a complete halt. Um, they, uh, uh, the parties were able to put it back on track. The dispute board kept working. And till this day, there are arbitration proceedings in Miami deciding the major claims. But guess what? The Panama Canal is working and the ships are, are, are going through and the country is earning the revenue from, from, from that huge important asset. So each one of the two uh, models serves a different purpose and they can work hand in hand. I, I would just add that I completely agree with Jerry and Aisha from an institutional perspective. You know, we're in the business of resolving disputes and nothing is uh, more rewarding to us than when we can do these things quickly and preserve the business relationships. Uh, so we certainly don't see these DARB procedures as competition to arbitration. As Aisha mentioned, it's all in the tool bag. And in fact, even the way these are written, we do suggest that if the DRB procedures are not successful, try mediation next, uh, which can also be quicker and uh, achieve some of the goals that uh, the DARB strives for. And in fact, even if the parties don't uh, are not successful in the resolution, the final arbitration step, well, in our rules, for example, the international rules, the mediation step is actually obligatory. It will take place concurrently with the arbitration unless the parties object to it and opt out of it. So along the way, along the continuum, we do everything we can to get these things resolved as quickly as possible. <clears throat> um, yes, thank you, Santiago, for, for the invitation also to, to this panel and to HDR. It's my pleasure to be here. I want to, to add um, that the, the infrastructure gap of the world is, uh, is very big and it's not closing, it's actually widening. So we need a lot of projects and the way we are doing things at the moment is creating the gap to widen. So we need to change the way we do things and there will be more work to everyone. There will be so much work if we start implementing the works, the, the, the the project we should be doing, that there will not be enough professionals in the world, really. Like climate change is increasing the gap, like in five times, the gap we usually talk about. It's five times bigger because of climate change. 
what we realize we should be doing. So I think we should not be afraid. Um, we really need to find a way to do the projects we, we need to do. And um, an additional point is that when, whenever there's a, an standing dispute board, the quality of the arbitration um, is higher because there are more uh, contemporaneous record. And here I want to make a comment to what was previously said, is that, um, well, for a dispute to arise, there needs to be an uncertainty, either an uncertainty on the facts or on the law. And dispute boards really um, um, makes uh, disappear a lot of the uncertainty in relation to the facts, because there's so much uh, contemporary contemporaneous records being produced um, on the meetings, on the recordings, on the uh, um, monthly reports, etc. So this really um, uh, makes many um, doubts about facts to disappear. Um, and then when, whenever there's a dispute, if there's a dispute, then it has much better quality of records. Uh, many times the theory of the case that is developed for an arbitration is very um, artificial. But in a dispute board, there's no much room for artificial theory of the case because you can see what's go really going on. So you can maybe build up a theory of an artificial theory of the case two years after, three years after what happened, but you cannot build an artificial theory of the case when it's like something that happened last week and everyone involved is in the meeting, right? Um, so these are these are some 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 remarks, and I think standing dispute boards also have like very uh, simple um, benefits as well. So for example, just uh, enhancing communication among the parties. Many times there's an elephant in the room and no one is talking about. Or maybe one party is asking a question and the other party is not replying. So you just need someone to say, hey, why are you not replying to this question? Why are you not talking about this? Why everybody like submits a report, a monthly report saying that everything is perfect, but there's a huge issue that no one is talking about. And these are the things that a third party can, can address um, with experience and also either with experience or just with fresh eyes. Just someone external coming and noticing things that the parties maybe they are too engaged in the project, they are too much in the, into the detail and someone from the outside with fresh eyes notices. Um, so I think, you know, there are many benefits um, that the dynamics of dispute board uh, bring to, to projects. And I think it's not a threat to arbitration at all. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. Uh, hopefully we have removed the fear of those who feel threatened by dispute boards. Now, uh, back to Jerry. Um, how does a dispute board, a board works in practice? Uh, how are usually appointed the members of a dispute board? Maybe you can also, Jerry, um, answer the, the, the question from Ana Maria Popescu, uh, who, who asked uh, something related to, to this issue. Um, let me read. Okay, great. Um, well, I have to say that there are there's some differences between my experience in the United States with you with dispute boards and my experiences in in Latin America with dispute boards. But um, uh, the concept is 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 essentially the same. The appointment of dispute boards um, is 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 a contractual uh, mechanism, me meaning this this needs to be in the contract and the process is. As Luis uh, described, generally, if it's a three-person board, um, each party will nominate one from a list of qualified, uh, pre-qualified uh, uh, dispute board members. And then the two dispute board members that are selected by the parties will pick the chair. Um, now, in, it, it's very important, essential, I would say, uh, for dispute boards to uh, to be qualified. And what does that mean? Um, it, it it goes beyond the understanding and and dominating all the rules and the mechanics and the operation of a dispute board. Dispute boards bring experience into uh, the the, the uh, dispute resolution process, meaning. 
Um, and, and this is more common in the United States where oftentimes dispute boards are, dispute board members are uh, retired engineers or retired lawyers that have, for lack of a better term, seen it all. They've had the experience of many, many, many years. And if you can bring a group of three people with that kind of talent and completely detached and un, have no bias and, and have are completely neutral, then you're bring you're you're providing the, the the project with the benefit of that experience and that uh, a wealth of knowledge to resolve and help the parties avoid uh, dispute boards. I say avoid, and that really applies to to permanent dispute boards as opposed to dispute boards that are ad hoc or conform just for a particular dispute to resolve it. Let's talk about, um, um, let's focus on permanent dispute boards. Permanent dispute boards are appointed at the beginning of the project and they live through the project. How do they do that? Uh, by meetings, recurring meetings with the parties, by site visits. I'm right now um, in presently in Costa Rica having done two site visits on two road projects after three, four months from my prior site visit and meeting with the parties um, to see what's going on, what are the troubles that are, that are uh, uh, facing, uh, the parties facing in the projects and trying to avoid their issues from escalating to formal disputes. So dispute boards operate by being part of the project team. Uh, and serving the parties in, in that role by being aware, by being informed, by bringing their experience, um, and then um, um, having regular meetings, uh, usually monthly on a monthly basis, we have meetings with the parties where they provide an update of, of each one of, of the issues of the uh, uh, progress of the project, as well as um, you know, uh, uh, problems that are brewing, uh, long lead items, supply issues, um, uh, whether it be uh, 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 defects or any, any of the issues that come up in every single project, because there's no project that doesn't have uh, a mix of these issues. And um, through, through the course of these meetings, um, uh, the, dispute, the disputer is able to uh, share some of their knowledge, not tell the parties what to do, but just uh, uh, assist them in trying to resolve the problems. And if that's not possible, then you get a referral by either side. Usually um, um, there's two types of assistance that a dispute board can provide. One is, is consensual, meaning, and, and less, less formal. When both parties want to ask a question, or present an issue to a dispute board for more of an in informal analysis. That has to be consensual, and that usually requires both parties uh, to, to, for that to happen. Formal referrals for disputes are uh, either, either party can present uh, and elevate a, 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 an issue as a, a formal dispute. And then once that happens, then you begin the, a, a pre-established process for uh, submissions of, of position papers by either side. Now you get into a process that is similar to an arbitration, but much more compact. Each side will present a position paper um, um, and then there will be a hearing um, where they can present their positions and, and, and pr bring witnesses, sometimes even bring experts if, if, if the issue is highly technical and the dispute board would benefit by uh, uh, the knowledge of the, uh, uh, of the experts. And then after that, um, there's a short period of time and the dispute board will issue a decision or a uh, recommendation depending on the variety uh, or the model that's being used. But that's usually the way that uh, a dispute will, uh, operates and, and the value that it provides. In Latin America, because it's an emerging model, um, dispute board members tend to be younger in the sense and, and, and less, less field experience and, and, and more uh, academic experience. But um, the only way to arrive at, at, you know, at the more advanced uh, stage that the US has 
is by doing exactly what, what we're doing here and promoting uh, 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 um, dispute board members to, to engage in the process and, and gain that experience so that they can eventually uh, uh, have you know, all, of, all of the tools required in order to benefit, uh, provide the benefit to the project. Thank you, Sherry. I, I don't know if he, Aisha, Luis, Eric have any comments. If not, maybe you, uh, all of you, uh, any of you can answer Muhammad's question about um, um, the powers of, of the, the dispute board members and, and if, if they have to, to have legal or contractual uh, knowledge about a uh, uh, for resolving the case. I don't know if any of you want to make a comment on this. I'm happy to, to briefly address it from my experience. Um, and ultimately, the dispute board members are construction professionals. Whether you start out as an engineer, as I did, and then add on legal knowledge practically or by education, or you start out as a lawyer and add understanding of the engineering process that goes into infrastructure projects, you have to come to the table with both um, an understanding, not an expertise of the technical, uh, because you can always look to having an expert or the party's arguments, but the, the, the referrals or the opinions that the, the dispute board um, are requested that are requested from a dispute board can be purely contractual provisions can be a combination can a lot of times will will deal with prolongation costs or um, schedule extension but i mean if you water it down to or boil it down there's always issues of time time and money right i mean at the end of the day on a construction project if there's time and money involved, then you may have disagreement between the parties and how are they going to resolve that. Um, so it can it can have its origins in a contractual provision or in a technical issue that then so similar to unforeseen site conditions. Is it an unforeseen site condition? Is it I, I mean, with COVID, is it force majeure? Is it not force majeure? Uh, do you get time? Do you get time and no money? Do you get time and money? Is it a change in law? Um, so all of those issues can be uh, the subject of a referral to the dispute board. Thank you, Aisha. Um, so back again to the relation between arbitration and dispute boards. Uh, Eric, um, I would like to ask you if it is possible to submit to arbitration a dispute previously resolved by a dispute board. and. I would like if you can explain us uh, what is a multi-tier dispute resolution clause and is it possible to bypass any of the steps set forth in this kind of clauses? Uh, yes, Santiago, thank you. Um, I think it's very important this question because uh, for uh, litigators and for arbitration practitioners, um, when they approach uh, dispute boards, maybe they um, don't immediately make the link um, about one step and the other. Um, uh, if you are considering having a dispute board in your project, you will be required to implement a multi-tier dispute resolution clause. Um, and this has legal effects. So what is essentially a multi-tier dispute resolution clause? This is a, a clause, instead of just making reference to any, uh, any dispute that goes to arbitration, it, uh, it has a, it a number of, um, of the steps that uh, allow for preventing or resolving the disputes. It can, um, um, have uh, two or more steps, um, for example, um, allowing uh, disputes to be resolved directly by the parties, like uh, um, um, amicable settlement steps, or it can be assisted by a third party, like a mediator or a dispute board, when it's a Sunday dispute board, for example, preventing a dispute, or by entirely delegating it to a third party. So, for example, an expert, an educator, or a dispute board, or arbitration is also, uh, um, arbitration is part of that uh, design of the, um, the multi-tier uh, clause. Um, some of these steps are alternative. For example, when you can choose between going to an expert or going to arbitration, 
and um, some are uh, requisites for moving to the next step, um, such as, for example, obtaining a decision from the dispute board before commencing an arbitration or having to wait for a cooling off period uh, or, or, or any other example we can think about. Um, there are various uh, types of steps, but some of the most common options used to structure these multi-tier clauses are negotiation or amicable settlement, mediation, conciliation, or facilitation, decisions or recommendations of experts or DBs, and arbitration. Um, the steps within a multi-tier uh, clause are believed to prevent or resolve disputes efficiently and quickly, avoiding high cost or distracting the party's attention to the contractual objective. And therefore, multi-tier clauses are beneficial because they allow procedures to be designed in a bespoke manner. It is already widespread practice in international construction contracts to include multi-tier dispute resolution clauses, and it's seen in bespoke agreements and in various standard contracts using the industry, such as PIDIC or NEC contracts. Now, lawyers and dispute resolution consultants tend to be very skeptical regarding multi-tier clauses. And one reason um, why contract drafters, drafters usually avoid or pay lip service, for example, to amicable settlement, is uh, to keep the language of uh, simple and to minimize complications that poor drafting might, uh, may create, so including admissibility or jurisdictional objections in a potential arbitration. Um, so specifically, this risk has created many academic and legal debates that analyze the validity, obligatory nature, and consequence of skipping any step. On the discussion of whether skipping the step causes issues of jurisdiction or admissibility, I know that the most uh, current trend in civil law uh, systems seems to be that it does create a problem of admissibility, which can generally be repaired within the same arbitration uh, and thereby allowing a uh, reduced risk of using multi-tier clauses. Uh, now, this risk exists on, for any step agreed, so even for dispute boards, and we must therefore not lose sight of the advantages of a well-regulated step. If that step is drafted correctly, the benefits outweigh the disadvantages, but it's something to bear in mind. That's great. Thank you, Eric. I don't know if Cherry, Aisha, please have any comments on this. Um, I, I think we have a, a last quest, a last question from uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing well, uh, Shasia Jonas, about uh, the mechanism for adopting arbitration and how it um, how it is communicated to parties or, or how it is, it is clear to to parties. I don't know. If any one of you can comment on this. I, go ahead, Aisha. No, 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 go ahead, Jerry. I'm, I'm... I, I, was, I, I just wanted to address and, and just comment on, on, on um, one of Eric's, Eric's uh, comments with, with which I agree, but also um, just plant this seed in, 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 our, in our audience's uh, uh, um, thought process. And, and that is having a dispute board I mean, by nature, people pr prefer to resolve their problems privately and not have a third party decide it for them. That's just human nature. And when you have a dispute board that um, renders one decision, one party is going to be happy, one party is going to be unhappy. And if you, over the course of a major project, you're going to have multiple decisions uh, by the dispute board. There comes a time, and I've seen this happen, where after getting um, a couple of unfavorable decisions, each of the parties all of a sudden find ways of resolving issues among themselves and not uh, uh, running the risk of, of giving it to a third party. So even as a deterrent of disputes, the dispute boards uh, provide value. That, that was my, my comment. Uh, on, on that issue. And, and I will just add to the, the maybe answering the question within the context of Eric's presentation of multi-tiered um, dispute resolution clauses. I think if, you, if you're going to have 
arbitration, the first thing is you, you, it requires the party's consent. And then if we add to that um, a multi-tiered dispute resolution mechanism, it may be uh, a mandatory, the tiers could be mandatory or not mandatory. If they are mandatory, I would again, leave the parties with this kernel, the interfaces between each of these steps need to be understood by the users of this multi-tiered dispute resolution clause. So for example, if you have a, a FIDIC um, contract, this it is multi-tiered and there, those tiers are mandatory. So you cannot um, arrive at arbitration before presenting the dispute board, uh, making a formal referral to the dispute adjudication board and having a notice of dissatisfaction with the, the result, resultant decision within 84 days. So that has to be made that, you know, circling back to uh, Shazia's um, question, you know, when you have a mechanism for adopting arbitration, it has to be by consent and you can put other criteria that allow, that, that serve as requirements to get to arbitration in, in the form of a multi-tiered mandatory clause. And my advice to parties is when you write such a clause is be very clear and make sure that people that are operating the clause are informed of what they actually have to do. Because if you go directly to arbitration on a FIDIC contract without making a 20.4 referral and having a dis decision and a notice of dissatisfaction, the arbitrators may find that they have jurisdiction, but yet the dispute is not admissible. And so you, you, you you want to make sure you don't get into a pathological arbitration clause. You, you need clarity. You need very clear um, understanding of what it is that you're trying to do. And you make sure that the people that are, that are operating, not only writing the clause, know, and the people that are operating the clause are well informed on how to make sure those interfaces, um, interfaces um, are well aligned. Eric, I'm adding to your 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 commentary, but uh, I hope I did it all right. I fully agree. Okay, and thank you very much. Uh, just to to um, keep all the the question answered, um, maybe Eric, uh, there is a question in in the chat. Um, is uh, regarding again the the multi tier uh, um, clause. Um, is uh, can you usually bring dispute board proceedings while arbitration proceedings are ongoing? And alternatively, once an arbitration has started, can you raise additional claims that have not been referred to the dispute board if a tribunal is already constituted? Or would you have to go through the dispute board process first? Mm. OK, so when we start going to the details, the cases are so diverse and so complex, could, could be very complex as well. Um, so generally, if well, if if uh, dispute boards are a previous step, generally, so uh, you might have an admissibility issue if you didn't go to the dispute board first. So, uh, and this can be cured easily if the dispute board is, is still in place. But if the dispute board is not in place, then you will have an issue whether the fact that you didn't go to the dispute board is. Uh, uh, banning your claim or not. And uh, that's a matter of access to justice and several other very deep discussions. Um, and well, I think it, it will depend on the tribunal as well how to decide. Um, so that's that's a thing, something about uh, complying with the previous step. Um, and, and the other question was about, um, so that was about Yes. Could you remember, please, what, Santiago? No, if, if um, 
if uh, once an arbitration has started, if you can raise additional claims that have not been referred to the dispute board if a tribunal is already constituted, or if you mm -hmm. have to go through the dispute board process first. And, I think that, and, that, that, that will also yeah. a matter of discussion with the tribunal, whether they want to be very strict with the, with the prior, prior step or not. Oh, okay, and, and, and if uh, you can bring dispute board proceedings while, while arbitration proceedings are, are ongoing, and I am um, yeah. it, typically not. I mean, the, the, the common practice is you go in order. And yeah. uh, um, if you have a dispute board uh, a clause that is a condition proceeding to arbitration, then our, the arbitrators will not have jurisdiction over the claim unless and until it's gone through the dispute board process. Um, and I've seen, I mean, I mean there are going back to the Panama Canal, as I mentioned, there are arbitration proceedings in Miami going on right now, but those arbitration proceedings are um, resolving and addressing decisions of the dispute board, which is still in operation and still deciding disputes after all these years. So they're still following the, uh, the, the, the tiers in, in, the, in the right sequence. And, and something just to, I think it's, it's useful for practitioners, is uh, for litigator is is that um, when you are dissatisfied with a decision from the DV, you don't need to go straight away to arbitration. You can generally wait and see how other decisions from the DV uh, go, and then you decide afterwards. So it's not that it's dissatisfaction. You need to go. It, you, you generally cap the statute of limitation to file your your arbitration. But it's only with time. one caveat, you must yeah. make the notice of dissatisfaction within 28 yeah. days, so it doesn't get final and binding. So you can make sure you have you reserve your right by issuing the notice of dissatisfaction and then wait on and develop a dispute strategy for arbitration with multiple referrals. Yes, absolutely. And, and just one comment on, on, on what Eric just said, I think I think it's you've identified put your finger on a, on a very important dynamic. As I mentioned, over the course of a large project, you're going to have multiple decisions. And then if you wait until the end um, and, and are evaluating whether or not to go to arbitration, let's say you won five decisions and lost five decisions. Before you start that arbitration, you're going to measure the risk of losing what you won because you're trying to win what you lost. And I've seen it many times where like arithmetic, they cancel each other and there is no arbitration. Yes, it's it's a fallacy that the, that the arbitrators cannot overturn a dispute board's decision. So, uh, you know, if you are awarded um, a certain extension of time and prolongation costs in a dispute board and you just feel you didn't get enough and you go to arbitration, they may uh, measure that your entitlement to zero right. and so just to Jerry's point, you know, trying to get what you didn't get, you lose everything you got. Correct. Thank you very much. That's very clear. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, um, I, I think we have a, a last question, but uh, uh, it is uh, the following. Is there a dominant view on whether failure to comply with multi tier dispute resolution clauses is a question of jurisdiction or admissibility? And if the latter, how would you justify it? By reference to the seat of arbitration? I don't know if someone can make a, a very a quick answer to this and then we can um, close the event. Jerry? I did, or I, yeah. I, I, sorry, I, did Jerry, were you gonna say something? Go ahead. If you no, no, I, I think that I believe we answered that question before uh, in, in the sense that if, if your contract says this is the sequence, then you need to follow that sequence and there will be jurisdictional objections, there will be admissibility objections if you skip any of, any of the steps in the sequence, so long as uh, the contract makes them mandatory and it goes back to what the parties agreed to. Yeah, and I, I just just to add to that, I think I think there's been a lot of academic writings about is it jurisdiction, is it admissibility, is it one or the other? And I think at the end of the day, for parties, 
it really, um, I think there is, there is a, a leaning towards that you, the arbitrators do have jurisdiction to decide disputes under this contract, but this dispute is not ripe to be admissible just yet. So admissibility would probably be where people are landing. But I would, I would say that this is an academic discussion, admissibility or jurisdiction. To the parties, it means delay. It means right. getting to arbitration and being sent back to a dispute board, either to constitute it from afresh or to refer that dispute to a dispute board again. So, um, you know, whether, however you characterize it, it is um, operating your multi-tiered dispute resolution clause inefficiently for the best interest of your client. Thank you to all of you. Okay, I think we are really out of time. Uh, it has a, a truly honor to moderate this panel. I would like to remind that a recording of today's event uh, will be, uh, I, I, I'm sure it will be uh, uploaded uh, uh, briefly to the ICDR's website. And of course, please, uh, I would like to remind you all the audience that uh, the ICDR uh, YNI group is um, available for everyone. So if you like to become a member, please feel free to do it. And well, that's all. Thank you all again for your participation today. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you. And thank you, Santiago, for your excellent moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. A pleasure. Bye. Thank you very much.